The Hey Band Network. Welcome to the Hey Band Network. Today we have Eric Cosman with us um, from the Austin area, and we're going to talk about TMEA audition, uh, virtual auditions for this coming fall semester, which are starting here shortly. And so Eric is a professional sound uh, engineer. Um, and sound designer, and so he has worked with the Blue Coats, Boston Crusaders, um, both those drum corps organizations. He's been in the activity for many years dealing with sound. Um, he is a mix person for flow marching, and he's done regionals and grand nationals BOA, uh, where he mixes the sound for uh, those big contests for flow marching. And then um, he is a sound consultant all over the state of Texas and elsewhere, and has been in many programs. Um, helping out and, and everything related to sound. This is one of those guys you call and, and bring into your program. Um, so uh, first, Eric, welcome to the Hey Band Network. Hey, great to be here. So um, the TMA process is very different since it's virtual for this year for the 2020 um, audition process. And so I thought that just let's get somebody that knows this stuff um, and try and help out every band director that's dealing with this this year anywhere. Um, for those, so we're dealing with the Music First platform. Um, that the team has set up. And so what we want to discuss today is use of the electronics and microphones and different devices to help you and your students. So um, anything in the process, just kind of an overlay maybe that, that you're from a sound standpoint that we can help our, our guests out? Yeah, I think that, well, the biggest thing is to make sure you play great. You know, I think we can really get lost in all the technology so easily because there's so many different options and we could do this and we could do that. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, that's going to be such a small percentage of it. So, you know, try not to get too bogged down um, in the technology. Obviously you want to test it and make it sure it works and get the best products, you know, that you can reasonably, but, you know, try to remember that the end goal is obviously the students playing the best they have. Uh, from a, a technical standpoint, the biggest thing that's going to help you no matter what uh, microphone you use is going to be the room area you record in. Um, if your rooms is very, like I would, I would not recommend like a practice room or a bedroom or any room that's small and square. Um, it's just going to sound very harsh and the reflections are not going to be good. Um, I would suggest a medium, like a, if you're at home, like a living room tends to work good. Usually it's a little bit higher ceilings, a little more space, um, maybe a, a large ensemble room um, if you're recording in school. Uh, because there's no processing or anything, you know, you can't add reverb after the fact, but you can record in a room that has natural reverb that sounds, you know, a lot better than if you're just in a practice room. Um, another thing you really want to focus on is cutting down all your extraneous noise. So your ceiling fan, your air conditioner, your dog rattling, you know, all, all that stuff um, that you don't think about. Uh, what I suggest people do is once you kind of get your zone and you're ready to go, go ahead, just hit record for like 30 seconds of nothing, just silence and then put on a pair of really good headphones and turn it up and just listen to what is actually coming through the headphones. Um, if there's, and if there's any undesirable sound, you know, try to, to run me that one uh, that I went through all throughout my room to record just to kind of see, uh, or all throughout my house rather, just to see kind of what worked. And the living room was the best place, but we have a open floor concept. And so when my refrigerator's air compressor would kick on, it was that kind of worrying whatever and it, it, it actually cut off in the middle of a rep and I really heard it. So that's just, you know, all those little things, they may not uh, seem like much when you're recording, but they kind of can add up and just add um, some muddiness to your recording. And great information for everybody going through the process, uh, any, any of the audition processes. Um, through this. So we're going to focus on the band audition process without playback today. So those listening, um, I know there's questions on, people have questions on the jazz stuff and maybe mariachi or even string and vocal, but this will be just our conversation because the material is just going to be focused on um, individual performer without a backtrack. Um, and so if you have questions on that, uh, reach out, we'll, we'll probably help you out. So um, let's jump in. So you've talked about the room and space and, and hopefully a lot of kids can, can record from school, probably have 
better devices and better um, equipment and better sp larger spaces for this. Um, and so some of this is kind of geared towards if a student's at home um, and that's their only option to record uh, Music First. And Music First is a uh, web-based program and it can be used on a computer, a tablet, iPad, or a cell phone or they have access. So um, let's start, start with a computer. Maybe we can kind of talk through some of those things in a setup and some things you, that a, a director and student can do to help them out as they get ready to use a computer to record. So the most important thing um, with any recording device is just going to be to set your input gain level. And that's basically the sensitivity of your microphone. So um, when you're on a, a computer, if you have, if you're using just the regular built-in microphone, no external, nothing plugged into it. If you go into your sound settings, Windows or a Mac, there's actually a, a volume, it says volume level, but it's really the gain level of your microphone and it'll give you little meters. And what you want to do is once you get your mic set up in the right spot, you want to kind of go ahead and play kind of some of the loudest um, parts of the etude and make sure that those meters aren't going all the way to the top. You want them kind of maybe to middle to two thirds area when you're recording. If not, you're going to get some, some distortion, uh, some clipping, some, some nasty sounds. So when you're using a computer, no matter Mac, PC, or whatever, that's, that's the first uh, step. Uh, if you're using um, a USB microphone or an audio interface and a microphone, same concept applies, but those devices actually have gain control built in on them, usually. Some USB microphones may not have a gain control, but again, you can still use that um, volume level in the settings of your actual computer to control that. And on some of the microphones, there's settings on, on how it picks up the pattern it picks up. Is there anything that would be useful to pick on that or you, um, options? Yeah, I think it's really um, just kind of experimentation and, and different things for different instruments. I, I guess I'll just go through maybe some of the buttons you may see and what they do. And that way you can kind of have an informed opinion on whether you should use them or not. So a button you'll find on a lot of microphones is a low cut. So usually it'll have a straight line on one side and then kind of like a, a Nike swoosh on the other. And what that does is it cuts all frequencies below a certain level, usually around 80 Hertz. So if you're a flute or a snare drum or, you know, something that's, that's mostly upper register or, you know, upper range of the frequency spectrum, you can go ahead and throw that switch on and that'll get rid of a lot of humming or thumping kind of noises that you don't want um, that aren't, you know, the, the, inst the sounds you're producing from your instrument. Now, if you're like a low brass, like a tuba, a trombone that does go down below 80 Hertz or wherever the crossover uh, for the low cut, you know, wherever that frequency is, um, then you'll want the microphone flat, that straight line. So that's an even response across all the frequencies and that you're not um, getting rid of those. That documentation should be available on, on any microphone you get. Um, and if you don't happen to know, you know, what frequency this note is, there's tons of frequency charts online. You can just find the lowest note and then search and then, you know, make sure you're not, not cutting those off. Another uh, button you may see is a pickup pattern. So some mics can change from omnidirectional, which records all around the mic, to a more unidirectional pattern. Um, and there's different names for those patterns, cardioid, hypercardioid, et cetera. Uh, but basically that just rejects the noise behind it. So for live applications, it's very advantageous to only pick up the sound in front of the mic because if you pick the sound behind the mic where the speakers are, you could get feedback because it's picking up its own sound out of the speakers. And it can be useful when you're recording as well. However, sometimes when you're recording, if the room you're recording in sounds really good, it can be advantageous to have an omnidirectional microphone where it's picking up all of the, the reflections and reverbs and, and natural sound of the room. Uh, now, a lot of that depends on microphone placement. You can still get room noise with a unidirectional microphone if it's not, you know, right up on the instrument, if you pull it back and, and give it some space. 
Uh, those are the two. Oh, the other the other switch that might find your microphone is just a pad switch. Um, and that's just automatically knocks the gain down usually by 10 or 20 decibels. So uh, let's say it doesn't have a gain control on the mic. You could put that pad on if you had like a snare drum or something that has, you know, a lot of volume to it. And that would help the microphone from, from clipping and, and distorting. Really good stuff. Awesome. Um, what about a, so we, we've kind of gone through what a computer could use in, in USB or onboard. Um, what about a tablet or an iPad type device? Yeah, so, so the, the big concern you want with um, mobile devices is a lot of them have a built-in compressor. So what that does is we were talking earlier about how if your, your microphone sensitivity, the gain is too great, then you could distort the sound. What a compressor does is once the volume reaches a certain level, in order to have it not distort, it will automatically turn down the microphone by a ratio. So uh, if you have no compression, it kind of goes like this in a straight diagonal. If you have compression, it goes diagonal till you get to about the point and then it's a more shallow angle instead of that way. So um, that can be a problem. Again, if you have a really loud instrument, um, it can affect your dynamic range and, and really it, it, you could hear it come on and off because it's, it's designed for when you're talking on the phone. So if you're talking or you know it's a loud and you have to shout, it kind of evens it out. But obviously when you're doing a uh, musical recording and you want a lot of that nuance, um, you don't really want that, that compression. So um, a good way to make sure you're, you're not hitting that compressor is to just make sure the mic isn't super close to the, um, the instrument. And I would say with, with mobile devices, uh, and I would suggest most microphones for this process where there's no post-processing allowed, there's no EQ, there's no anything. Um, having the mic a little bit further away from the instrument than you normally would in like a live setting or marching band where you're really trying to get just that instrument and isolate it from everything else, um, especially for the mobile devices will help because uh, if the mic's further away, it's not picking up as strong of sound, so it's less likely to hit that compressor. What you're saying, like the placement of the performer is going to be a big impact too, how far you are, how, how it relates to the microphone. You talked about, you know, doing some tests and without anything going on, then also just testing and see what it sounds like. But it sounds like that's going to be very important also for the, the student performer when they record. Absolutely. Um, how about, so we kind of talked about a phone, anything else? And we kind of talked about tablet phone that's kind of all work together in terms of the microphones, right? Yeah. Just, just a, a tip, you know, it's just audio, which is nice. A lot of times it's video and audio. And I would say always go where the audio is best. And then the video just kind of is what it is. Um, since it's audio, it's, it's less of a concern. Um, I bought this little tripod for my phone from Walmart for like $10 and it's super handy because uh, you can get your phone further away and kind of place it maybe a little bit above the instrument versus just like lower on a table. Um, it, it helps you to get the microphone of the phone in a, a better location. And just with a little stand. So you'd even recommend trying to get a little higher up than maybe a direct directional instrument of the sound. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I think especially uh, when you're trying to get a little bit of that room noise to just make it sound more natural, getting it a little bit higher um, helps. Man, that's useful. Very useful. Um, so let's jump into microphones a little bit. Um, we've talked about what's on the device, but anything specific on mics that um, maybe directors can have, you know, I've got, I've purchased one to do this stuff and it seems to work all right. And I know there's stuff at schools. And so I know there's stuff for devices also you can plug in. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is location. Mic location is, is just the biggest. And also we are aiming at the mic um, or aiming past it. Now, if the mic's further away, you can kind of aim towards it, but usually I kind of aim just a little to the side of it. So it's not so 
laser beam, it tends to get just a little darker sound. Uh, if you're just a little bit off axis, you know, or maybe the microphone is above you shooting down, but you're kind of just playing this way. So getting the microphone off axis sometimes can help uh, darken up the sound. Uh, but again, when the mic's further away, it's less, uh, it has less of an effect. Um, when you're, I guess, selecting your microphone, you know, um, I've had lots of folks come up to me and what mics do I need to buy? What do I need to buy? What do I need to buy? And I was like, well, you've got 18 large diaphragm condenser microphones on your keyboards that you're not using right now because you're not doing marching band. You know, those are great mics, you know, and um, lots of band rooms I go in and they have these incredible mics that they got when the school opened to record rehearsal, but they've never been set up and they're just sitting in a drawer. Um, so, you know, I think most programs um, have at least some decent mics lying around. Um, so kind of before you go out trying to purchase stuff that, you know, hopefully you're only used for one year, hopefully things go back to normal in the fall but of next year, but who knows? Um, you know, that way, you know, obviously money is always a concern. And if you can either not buy something that's one dimensional, or if you do buy something, buy something that can be used for other applications, um, then, then it becomes more of a, a blessing uh, in disguise. So um, a couple different types of mics, there's condenser mics and dynamic microphones. Um, the, the difference is essentially kind of this, let's see, what's the easiest way to describe this? They, they work similar uh, functions, but they're separate. So a dynamic microphone, the sound waves move the diaphragm and there's a magnet and the diaphragm is copper. And so when the copper passes the magnet, it creates an electrical current. So it turns your sound wave into an electricity wave and then the ones and zeros take over and convert it and all that. A condenser microphone is similar, except it's kind of already powered with what's called phantom power from the audio interface or from the mixer. And so it can detect a little bit more uh, finer uh, changes of the diaphragm because, but for all intents and purposes, they pick up sound the same. A diaphragm moves, it turns it to electricity your audio interface turns it into ones and zeros, and then it goes up to the website. So there's two types of condenser microphones. There's large diaphragm, um, AT2035, which a lot of people have on the marimbas. Or if you've seen lots of, you know, radio hosts, the kind of big one, you know, it's kind of uh, avicular. That's a large diaphragm condenser. And then there's a small one small condenser, they kind of look like um, cigar mics is kind of another uh, term for them where they're, they're a little bit skinnier, um, both great. Um, and then dynamic microphone, uh, usually uh, used for vocals or, or drums. Um, I got a 57 here, that's like the gold standard um, kind of workhorse uh, dynamic microphone. And what about for, let's say a, a, it's more of a student, is there anything they might be able to get? Are they, they're not going to be on campus to be able to record? And so they're at home. And so maybe they do want to invest in that. Yeah, what I've been telling people to look at is actually um, a lot of uh, us had these in college, but they make an updated version, which can be used essentially as a USB microphone, but it's those handheld Zoom recorders. Um, they make, you can get a, a handheld recorder that has two microphones on it pointed this way. So it's a stereo pair versus a mono microphone. So it's just a little more realistic, the sound, um, for under a hundred dollars. And, and so, um, you just need to make sure that it can be used as an audio interface. So a lot of them, they have a, a USB port on it and then you plug it into your computer and then on your computer, you just select, you know, input device, the Zoom. Um, and those are great because, uh, well, they're stereo, they can be mounted uh, usually on a camera tripod or even that little phone thing, I think, 
would probably work. Uh, but they're also nice because, you know, if this student is going to be going to college or whatever and wanting to record practice sessions, wanting to record themselves, it's something that can be useful down the road and something they can use kind of for their whole musical career. And it's portable. You don't need a laptop. You don't need, um, you know, any other device. Um, now, obviously, when you do music first, it needs to be plugged into your laptop to be used. But I'm just talking kind of in non-COVID times, you know, it could be a device that's that's really useful for them. So to, to make clear, because I, luckily I've had some people around and uh, to help me teach me about this electronics and microphones and stuff the last few years, but you said it's a microphone, it's a Zoom microphone uh, or recorder, but the purpose, the way it's set up is that it's not really functioning as a recorder for this. It would just essentially be a microphone, correct? Correct. It just passes the signal from the mics live into the computer. Cool. Very cool. Um, and then what about, let's say I, I really, I don't have a lot of options or a kid that lives out. Maybe they just, they will not get into town or get into a place where they can have it. Is there anything for, and all they have is a phone, something along those lines they can get might be pretty affordable too. Yeah. Uh, sure makes, I think they're back in stock now. They were kind of out of stock for a while. A lot of this stuff was out of stock when COVID hit because everyone was all of a sudden online. Um, it's called an MV88. Take the windscreen off here. Let's see y'all can see. So it's actually a stereo microphone and it is a lightning connector. So it goes right into your iPhone. And this is the same concept as I was saying, like a, a handheld recorder it's the same deal it just plugs in um, and it's actually it's really good quality i use this a lot when i'm going to different schools um, and they do a run through and i kind of want to just get a good recording of of what we did um, and it, it it works it works really well um, and then it has an app with it where you can set the gain and you can actually set the stereo field of how wide or how narrow it is so uh, it's a really good option. Probably around, uh, I think with tariffs, it, it's like 150 now. It used to be around like 120. Um, but, but if you could find that, and there are similar products as well, um, it's a really good option. So it sounds like for the student, there's some options out there to try and get a, a stereo. If they can't get into a school to do the recording, finding a way to do it in stereo would be helpful. Um, one of those devices along those lines versus the mono just on your device. Yeah, I, I would think for anybody, um, a stereo recording just sounds more natural, um, especially uh, when you're trying to pick up the reverberations of the room. Obviously, they, they go and they travel and they hit at different times. So having a stereo microphone pair, it really makes it seem more natural. So um, yeah, if, if, if you can get that, I would suggest that. That's probably the, again, if you have no EQ, no post-processing, no anything, I would set up a stereo mic, kind of medium, not close, not far, medium away uh, from the player, get in a good room. That sounds great, you know, with nothing going on. Um, and that's, that's probably what I would do. Awesome. Very helpful. Um, other tips, any other tips? Maybe you've kind of, you've hit a ton of great stuff in a short amount of time too, which is, is, is wonderful for anybody listening. Um, but any other tips maybe in this process that would help out uh, we can pass on to our students? I think the big thing and is just don't wait till the last minute to hear what it sounds like. Um, I know we always say don't let, wait till the last minute on everything, but Really, the last thing you want to do when you're trying to record and trying to get your take is mess with all the technical stuff. So um, I know we, we, when we're not there and we don't have it perfect just how we like it, sometimes we don't like to hear recordings and record and no, it's not ready yet, it's not ready yet. But I, I would really encourage, you know, right now, even if it's not where you want it, figure out where you're going to record, what you're going to record with and record some of your practice sessions. So that way you can do all your trial and error and all your technical stuff when you're just rehearsing. So when you are recording for you know the actual recording, you could get your headspace in 
the recording and the music and all that other stuff and not all the, the technical stuff. Awesome. Great, great, great information for everybody to use and pass on to their students. So any shout outs you'd like to give? Uh, I just want to give a shout out to all the band directors, percussion directors, color guard directors. Um, my wife's a color guard director, so I kind of see firsthand the craziness that y'all are going through. It's like, you know, we thought regular marching band season was stressful and chaotic and being pulled in 20 directions. And it's somehow been magnified 10 times. But you know, the few programs that I've been around this year, it's it's just incredible. You know, they're putting the students first. They're making the best of the situation. And I would even argue, you know, some programs, the, the kids are getting a better experience now than before when we kind of just, you know, we get in a routine and in a rut. We just kind of do the same thing every year. But kind of being forced to start over from scratch. Um, I'm seeing a lot of really cool new ideas, you know, of, of how to keep the, the students engaged and, and, and do all these different things. And so um, it's been really impressive. So hats off to all the band directors. You guys are awesome. Absolutely. All over the place too. So, so true what you say. So Eric Cosman, I, I thank you so much for joining me on this Hey Band Network to talk about the TMEA process and how to record and, and help out some band directors that they can pass on stuff that the kids, their, their own students can really use over the next few months as they travel into this new audition process. So appreciate you coming on today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right. And everybody else, make sure you check out our YouTube channel, Hey Band Network, and our Facebook page to check out this video and other videos. Thank you for joining us.